Hey guys, all right, so I'm gonna take a few minutes. Uh, this video is gonna go through the process of um, applying to IRB. I wanna go through what the steps you're gonna take, how you go about them, go through some of the forms and just kind of generally walk you through that. Um, as I've said before, it, not, not all of you will necessarily need to go through IRB. And so if you're not sure about whether you're gonna be required to go through IRB, then just you know email me, let me know. Uh, for most of you, I think it should be clear. Most of you have probably already talked to you about it. So um, let me just go ahead and start with share screen. So um, I can move this a little bit. Okay. Um, all right, so if you go to uh, pages, you should see that there's a page called IRB. So we're gonna click on that. And it has uh, the application with, it says roads edits. I'll point that out in a minute. That's sort of me answering the questions as if I was creating this uh, list of questions that you should go over, which we'll talk about in a second. And then a video, which I'm making right now, which I haven't posted yet. So that will be, that will be there in a minute. Um, you want, we want to start off by going to the HSU website. I'm just going to type in HSU TX um, IRB. I never know the complete website, but. It's, it's the first thing that comes up when you do that, yeah. So yeah, it's a whole long HSUTX slash about HSU slash leadership administration slash, yeah, you don't need to remember that. Just just uh, Google HSUTX, IRB, should be the first thing that comes up. Um, and this is all the instructions you need for, for how to go about it. So let's start, let me start um, going through it here. This IRB organizational chart, you don't need to worry about this. This is just some sort of stuff they have to do for their compliance. You know, the, In other words, their regulations saying that they have to have a document showing what the chain of command is for the, for the IRB. So that's not really something you have to worry about. All right, submitting a new study. This is something you have to worry about. Now, this is a couple flow charts that help explain whether you need to do IRB. Now, I have already, most of you have already talked to you about whether you need to go, whether you need to go through IRB. But this is a flow chart. If you didn't, if you had no idea, you don't know sort of how to, you don't know what requires IRB, what doesn't. This is a flow chart you can use to help you make that decision, right? And so as you go through, you just do yes, no answers to all these different questions. And then as you go through, it'll, it'll let you know um, whether you uh, have to go through an IRB um, process, okay? Most of you are, uh, those of you who are doing IRB, so most of you are not doing IRB, but those of you who are doing IRB, most of you will be able to do this, what's called an exempt research application, which I will go over right now. I have it here. This is the one that I wrote here where it says Rhodes edits. So let me just open it, go through some of these questions. Okay. Um, you see the areas in, where is it? Yeah, these areas in yellow are the areas where I, you know, made up, made up stuff. But let's go through here. Uh, you are going to be an HSU undergraduate student. That's where you're going to check, put in, put in some information here, your, your contact information. Your faculty advisor is me. And so this is the information you would put in for that. Co-investigators, you're probably not going to have a co-investigator. Um, there might be some scenarios where your, your field supervisor may want to be listed as a co-investigator. Um, I don't know that that's ever happened, but that is conceivable. But most of you will not actually need to, will not be listing a co-investigator. Um, all right, is off campus. Most of you are probably doing this off campus. Now here's the part where you need to kind of um, really clue in exemptions. So there are eight possible reasons why a study might be able to fill out this thing called an exempt research application. Now, and it's a little confusing because it sort of sounds like if I tell you you're exempt, you might think, oh, cool, I don't have to go through IRB. Or you're exempt, oh, cool, I don't have to fill out these applications. And that's actually not what it means. Uh, because if you are exempt, what it means is you have to fill out an exempt research application, which is just uh, basically it's uh, it's an application in which you're asking them to exempt you from a full IRB review. That's what that's what we mean when we're talking about exempt here. You are asking for the exemption, and you are asking for that exemption uh, on based on one of these eight different criteria. Uh, I'm not going to read through all of these. Um, you can read through all of them, but most of them will not apply to your study. Now, most of you, exemption two 
will apply to your study. Research that only includes interactions involving educational tests, survey procedures, interview procedures, or observation of public behavior, if at least one of the following criteria is met. So most of your studies are gonna be um, described here by this exemption number two. And so uh, here's one of the criteria. If the information obtained is recorded by the investigator in such a manner that the identity of the human subjects cannot readily be ascertained directly or through identifiers linked to the subjects. Um, and so this would mean that you're, you're doing research in a way that, that does not allow you to actually match the data to the person who gave you the data, right? We call that de-identified data. You want it to remain anonymous. You want it to be something where you know, if, uh, if for some reason someone came across the spreadsheet, they would not know, which that can't happen, by the way. No one can come across your spreadsheet. But if someone were to come across your spreadsheet every day, they should not be able to say, oh, row six, where it describes a Hispanic male. Uh, I bet you that is uh, John, my friend John, right? They should not be able to do that. Uh, you should have no identifiable information. All right, uh, next one says, any disclosure of a human subject's responses outside the research would not reasonably place the subject at risk of criminal or civil liabil liability or be damaging to the subject's financial standing, employability, educational advancement, reputation. So this is going to be, you would check that. This is true of your, you know, your, you know, of most of you at least. I don't, I don't know of any of you that are trying to do research that puts subjects at risk of criminal or civil liability or could be damaging to their financial standing, employability, or educational advancement or reputation. Um, and then we're just going to keep going through here. You can, like I said, you can read through these later. Some of these apply to some, but most of them don't. Um, all right. Now the research proposals. This is the part that's going to take the longest uh, time for you. I'm going to go through here, let you know a little bit. I'm not going to read word for word everything I wrote here, but you should read everything word for word that I wrote here and take it as a suggestion for how to write it up yourself. Um, so provide a summary, provide a one paragraph summary of the research that includes a brief description of purpose, methods, potential risks, and risk management procedures in lay language. You'll notice here that this, you'll notice as we go through it, that this stuff, risks and risk management and privacy um, and confidentiality, these are things that are very, very important to the IRB committee. So you need to be paying special attention to that. In fact, you know, that when, when we talk about the IRB making sure your study is ethical, essentially that is what we're talking about. An ethical study is one that is aware of and minimizing the risks to the subjects. It is a study that cares about the confidentiality, the privacy of the, uh, of the, of the subjects, and is taking all the efforts necessary to maintain that privacy and that confidentiality and to safeguard the uh, subjects right to privacy and to subject their to, to, to safeguard their well-being, their physical well-being, their emotional well-being. And so really as you're as you're filling out this form, you want to be thinking about telling a story uh, in which you're telling the IRB, I am going to make sure that my subjects are okay. Okay. I'm going to make sure that nothing I'm doing is hurting them in any way. I'm going to make sure that nothing I'm doing is, has the possibility to violate any um, you know, confidentiality or any agreements or anything like that. All right. So here I made up a, I made, I made up a study. I kept calling my agency the XXX agency uh, about parental discipline and parent training programs. Uh, you see, it's a very brief uh, uh, description here. I told them I'm trying to survey about 40 parents and guardians over that time. There's no physical risk posed and only minimal emotional risk. Now we're going to get more into the nuts and bolts of this later, but in this opening paragraph, you're just sort of talking about that in a, in a broad sense. All right, state the specific purpose of your research study. Specify aims and what questions or hypothesis this research is designed to answer. Um, you can see what I have here is very, very specific. I have my two hypotheses. Hypothesis number one, parents who completed the parent training program will view spanking more negatively than parents who did not complete the parent training program. And number two, parents who completed the parent training program will view non-physical discipline methods like timeouts, more positively 
and parents did not complete the parent training program. So you see, I'm making up the study where I have these, uh, these two groups of parents. Some of them completed this parent training program and some of them not. And I'm administering this survey to them. Uh, and one of the, the, one of the things in the survey is asking questions about uh, their views of, of discipline, of how to discipline children. And my hypothesis is basically that they will view that those who, those who completed this parent training program will have different views of discipline than those who did not view the parent training program. That's my hypothesis. That's what I'm exploring here. All right, describe the need for your research study. Cite references in the text to justify the need of the study and all hypotheses. State the relevance of this research to and potential for contribution to the field of research. Now for that right here, for this section, you just paste your introduction and your literature review. This should be, your, if your introduction and literature review is not doing this, is not talking about the need for the study and the relevance of the research, then you didn't do a, you didn't write it correctly. So your introduction and literature review should deal with this, should address the need for the research study. All right, next, describe how subjects will be recruited for your study. This is gonna vary from person to person, right? Some of you are, um, you know, uh, using clients who are like already in the system that, uh, that, that your agency uses. Some of you are, um, you know, going to some kind of meeting that clients go to. And that's at that point that you're going to be recruiting, right? There's all kinds of different ways you can be recruiting subjects to, to participate in the study. And whatever that is, you've got to go in detail here. So where will subjects be recruited from? I wrote the agency currently serves between 200 and 250 Abilene residents. About 75 of those individuals are parents. Currently the agency has 35 parents enrolled in the parent training program. So I'm talking about where they're recruited from. How will they be identified? For the parents who are enrolled in the parent training program, they will receive an email asking for participation in the study. At the first and second trainings, they will be reminded of the survey. At the conclusion of the third and final training, they will be administered the survey. For those who do not participate in the parent training program, an email will go out that asks them to respond to an online survey. So I'm going to detail here about how am I letting these folks know about this survey or about the interview or about you know, whatever it is you're doing. Materials. Um, if you have like... Um, you know, any kind of information you're using to recruit, like that email that, you're, that I just wrote that I'm sending out um, to ask them to participate, that would need to go here. Um, uh, describe the measures that will be taken to ensure voluntary participation. I wrote the emails will be clear that participation in the survey is completely voluntary and that respondents who decide to fill out the survey may change their mind at any time. And as we'll see here in a second, as you go through your consent documents, that, that is, uh, that is uh, dealt with there too. All right, uh, informed consent documents. Indicate the informed consent document used to document informed consent for each group. Um, and you're gonna have to submit a copy of this informed consent document. Um, most of you are gonna do this consent to participate. This other stuff is, is probably not relevant to what you're doing. Next, vulnerable populations. If you are doing um, vulnerable population, if, if you're doing a study in which you are, are uh, interacting with a group that is considered a vulnerable population, then that just basically uh, makes the IRB um, provide a little more scrutiny to your study, okay? Um, and who counts as a vulnerable population? Well, you can see here children or minors under 18, pregnant women or fetuses, neonates, which is another word for newborns, those with an impaired decision-making capacity, uh, prisoners, Stop, research with prisoners cannot be exempted. So if you're doing research with prisoners, you cannot fill out a request for an exempt application. You'd have to go through the full IRB application. Uh, those who have economic or educationally disadvantaged, students or elderly. Um, and so if, if any of these are, are included under vulnerable populations, check that here. Inclusion criteria, what characteristics must subjects have to be in this research? Um, so, this is just sort of what do these folks have in common? Why, why are you identifying them for study here? I wrote here, they must be parents who are receiving services of some kind from my agency. Some of them must have completed the parent training and some of them must have not enrolled in the parent training. So they got my, so I got my two groups to compare. Exclusion criteria, what characteristics would exclude subjects from the research who are otherwise eligible? Um, I wrote, any clients of the agency who are not parents will be excluded. Um, will participants be compensated? You know, it's, that's nine times out of 10 or 99 times out of 100 in this case, that's gonna be no, you're not planning to compensate them in any way. Um, 
Do you expect to enroll anyone whose first language is not English or who is not fluent in English? Um, and if the answer is yes, you're gonna have to um, say sort of what the, uh, uh, what the language is and how you're going to go about that. So you might need, for example, you might need a copy of your survey in Spanish or whatever language it is. Um, and you'll need to go through and have us have a, um, a uh, plan for, for that. Now, this, is a, this adds another wrinkle to the study. So if there's any way for you to do the study without engaging in folks whose English is not, who's, who's, who are not uh, English second language, uh, then that just make things makes things simpler for you. So that's something to think about. Design and methodology. Um, I didn't actually answer this one, but you need to go through and look. Describe the research design. Explain your experimental methods in a step-by-step -step manner. So you need to really go through in detail here what are the steps you're taking. Describe the procedures and activities that the participants must complete and undergo. Describe any special considerations associated with the subject tasks at the location. For example, if subjects are students, identify whether class time is used or activities take place outside of classroom time. Address non-participating students, supervision of non-participants, et cetera. Pro provide as appendices examples of surveys, photos, illustrations that will aid the IRB members. Submit a flow sheet as a separate document if it will aid in understanding. So basically what you're doing is you're just going step by step. I'm recruiting them in this way. I'm gonna ask them the questions in this way. Right, we're going to be. I'm going to do it at this interview, or I'm going to meet with them, or I'm going to call them on the phone, or all the little steps that 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 you any you cannot have too much detail here. Um, and I guess if you do have too much detail, you'll send it to me, and I'll tell you tone it down. But I would I would lean in the direction of putting in more information, putting in more detail if you're unsure. Um, deception or incomplete disclosure. Does the research involve any deception or withholding of complete information? Uh, in most cases, that's going to be no. You know, some studies do this. A lot of psycho a lot of studies in psychology can do this, where it's like, you know, we, we're we're telling you that the study is about, um, I don't know, how fast you can do this puzzle, but really what they don't know is the study is about something that happened in the waiting room or whatever. Um, that's there's not much of a chance that you're going to be doing something like that. All right, risk and benefits. Here's another one you gotta you gotta be make it really clear to the IRB that you're paying attention to this. List and describe the risks related to confidentiality or psychosocial issues and how they will be managed. If your answer to this is there are no risks, the IRB is not gonna like that because in some sense there, even if the risks are minimal, there's always gonna be some kind of risk here. So I wrote, there are no risks related to confidentiality as the survey forms cannot be linked to the respondents. There is minimal psychosocial risk as our respondents are asked to think about their views of discipline, including physical forms of discipline, such as spanking. There is a possibility that parents could experience stress and anxiety when thinking about this subject. Now, that may seem a little silly, right? That, that um, giving someone a survey about what do you think about spanking and what do you think about discipline, it may, be, it may seem silly to think about that as causing stress, but it can cause stress. And you have to take that seriously. You have to acknowledge that that is a possibility for the IRB to, to know that you're really thinking about these things. Um, what are the anticipated benefits? Parents who are asked to think about their beliefs about discipline may be more thoughtful as they engage in disciplining their children on a day-to-day -day basis. Anticipated benefits for society. The agency will know more about the effectiveness of this parent training model, and they will be able to do a better job with their parent training in the future, which has the potential to help dozens of parents in Abbe. All right, next, data collection and protection. Um, here's where you're going to go through some specifics about how you're collecting the data and what you're doing with it after you've collected it. Where will you collect the demographic data or direct subject identifiers? So, um, I'm so I'm sorry, it says, will you collect demographic data or direct subject data first? I'm gonna say yes. In most cases, it is gonna be yes. I will collect basic demographic information, including sex, race, and age bracket for statistical controls. This will help me show that any differences between the two groups is caused by parent training program. Describe how the data will be kept confidential during collection, analysis, and storage, including what coding system will be used. Now, this is important. They, they wanna see that you are, um, taking steps to ensure that the data remains private, the data remains concealed from anyone who shouldn't see it, and the data remains unconnected to de-identified from the individuals who it, who it represents. 
So I wrote, uh, data is kept confidential by the fact that there is no identifiable information on the form. So in the study that I made up, I've got them filling out the survey and the survey does not ask them to put their name or their birthday or their social security number or their anything else that could be linked to them. Um, each form will have an ID number that will be put into the spreadsheet, but will not be linked to any identifiable information. Uh, describe how the data will be coded, stored, and transferred. For the paper forms, I will store them in a locked filing cabinet in the social work offices. The faculty are the only people with a key, and they will give me the surveys when I need them. At a desk in the social work offices, I will transfer the information from the paper survey to the password protected file on my password protected laptop, and then put the forms back in the locked filing cabinet. For the online surveys, the data will exist in a password protected SurveyMonkey account and will be transferred to a password protected file on my password protected laptop. I know this sounds like, this sounds like I, I'm acting like I'm dealing with like high level government secrets here. And I'm actually not dealing with high level government secrets, but again, the IRB committee, they are responsible for making sure that you are responsible with, uh, with the confidentiality. So you need to go through those steps telling them, I'm gonna protect the, if there's paper surveys, I'm protecting the paper surveys. They're going to be in my control uh, after I leave the meeting, and then I'm taking them. Then the next day, I'm putting them in the social work locked filing cabinet, whatever. And y'all can talk to Professor Milliron <coughs> and them about that. Um, about that. About how to how to go about that. They're not going to have a problem with that. Um, all right. Let's see. Code link. Will a link between participants and any direct identifiers be retained after the data collection is complete? I'm going to say no for mine. I'm not trying to. Um, maintain the ability to to identify who filled out this specific survey i'm not i'm not interested in that um list all data collection instruments surveys questionnaires etc that will be used in the research i said there will be one survey included in the appendix of this application so uh you may be having more than one survey but in this thing i made up there's there's more. Um, all right, will audio or visual recordings or photographs of subjects be made i said no but if so you're going to have to you know uh sort of go through the steps of explaining to them how you're gonna how you're gonna care for that. Will subjects medical, academic, or other personal records be assessed for screening purposes? I'm sorry, access for screening purposes during this research. No. Accidental disclosure. How will the data be protected against disclosure to the public, other researchers or non-researchers? The data will never have any identifiable information. It will remain in a locked filing cabinet in a password protected file on a password protected laptop. This starts to get repetitive after a while, and that's okay, as long as you're, as long as the IRB committee can see that you're concerned. Um, will protected health information be received or used? That's gonna be no for almost all of you, I would think, but maybe not for all of you. Although I guess now that I think about it, some of you, if you're doing research on um, some folks regarding mental health issues, then you do have some um, health information there. Um, if you're enrolling students, will you give extra credit? I'll say not applicable because I'm not enrolling students. How will the data be stored? It will be stored in a password protected Excel file or in a password protected laptop. The paper copies will be kept in a locked filing cabinet in the social work offices. When will the data be destroyed? The data will be destroyed at the end of the semester. Um, what is the estimated sample size? I expect to survey about 20 parents currently enrolled in the parent training program and about 20 parents who are not enrolled in the parent training program. This is about half the total parents who receive services from XX. And then finally, data analysis. Describe how the data will be analyzed. Qualitative data is collected, describe the analysis method. So I wrote, the data analysis will be a simple comparison of means for the survey questions. I will calculate the views of discipline from the research group and the comparison group and compare them to one another. I will also include basic descriptive statistics about the sample, including demographic characteristics. Now, most of you are gonna end up with, if you're doing a quantitative analysis, you're gonna have something fairly similar to this. Right? There's a lot of like, let me compare their, their scores before this happened to their scores after this happened. Or let me compare the scores of this group to the scores of that group. And so that's what you're describing here. Uh, that's what I put there. I've got these two groups and I'm comparing the means, I'm comparing their answers to this views of discipline. Um, and again, this is something just like, just like most of the stuff we've done this semester. If you feel like uncertain as you're writing this, that's okay. Just do your best, send it to me and I will help you. I will tell you, you know, what needs to be improved. Uh, conflicts of interest. Does anyone associated with the research team have a conflict of interest? I said, no. And you know, that would just be, y'all I mean, understand this. It would be like uh, if your, you know, your sister works at the agency or your best friend is one of the clients or something like that. Um, 
Then you want to attach all necessary documents, the signed investigator assurance form. We'll look at that in a minute. Copy of research training. We'll look at that in a minute. The vulnerable populations considerations form. We'll look at that in a minute, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll want to attach the um, survey instrument as well. If that's All right. So let me get off that now and go back to our... Um, Here is a, I call this IRB rubric. This may not be the best word for it, but it's here as well. I used to be, I used to serve on the IRB committee. And when I served on it, this was one of, this was a checklist that they asked us to use to go through to determine whether the study, whether the IRB application was, you know, filled out to the, to the highest standards. Uh, this may not be the, the form that they currently use. In fact, it's probably not the form they currently use, but these are still important issues. And so after you filled it out, go through read these questions and make sure that you have answered all these questions in the, you have dealt with all these issues, right? Was the adequate background information provided to support the need for the study? Did you tell me why the study is important? Uh, was the purpose of the study stated? Did the investigator pose a research question? Did they identify the research design? Um, were the methods collecting data adequately described? Were the methods of analyzing data adequately described? What's the type of research subject identified? So who are you researching here? The estimated sample size provided. How big is your sample size? Um, special populations, recruitment methods. Are you compensating? How are you, inferior, how are you ensuring confidentiality? Are you interested in, are you thinking about physical risks? Are you thinking about psychological risks? Are there alternative treatments? Did you give a reference list? Did you give appendices? And did you give an informed consent? So if you go through, um, after you've written, go through and make sure that the answer to all these is yes, that you have uh, addressed all things to the best of your ability in this paperwork. All right, let me go back over here. So that would be filling out this exempt research application. Ideally, you'll be able to just do that and you won't have to go through. These are a little bit more involved, expedited or the full review. All right, now we have our submission instructions. After you do that, after you fill that out, um, you want to go through and read this, download, the, uh, download and complete the appropriate application, complete the supplementary documents, which is, appears here later. Email all documents as separate files. This is important. Email them as separate files to IRB. Submit all documents with the last name and first initial of the principal investigator before the assigned file name. So you got you to gotta do this the way they want it, okay? So Smith J HSU exempt research application, um, Flower P full review application. You see, it's the it's my last name and my first initial and then the name of the document. Okay, make sure you title that correctly and make sure they're all separate files. Um, submissions must be accompanied by the signed investigator and faculty advisor assurance form. So let's look here. Um, for exempt applications, submit the following. The first, the exempt research application. That's the document that we just went through. Next is the investigator and faculty assurance form. Let's click on that. This is not a very involved form, but it, it is something that I have to sign. So you'll write your title. You'll, you're the principal investigator. And you're, um, then you're, then, oh wait, no. I'm the, I'm the principal investigator on this. Is that, and I went through this. Yeah. So uh, in fact, I will just be filling this out and sending it to you. That's what it is. You just need to tell me the title of your project and I can, I can fill this out and send it to you. All right. uh, next, uh, informed consent. It's a good time to go through that. You have to make an informed consent form. You're the people who are doing your interview or filling out your survey or whatever, they have to sign off. Giving, giving permission for you to gather their information and analyze their information in the study. Okay, so you're gonna, this is a good sample letter, but you're gonna need to go through and change this, okay? You can see there's stuff here that won't really, that won't really apply to you. Um, you're invited to participate in the study because you are blank, blank, blank. The purpose of our survey is to blah, blah, blah. It has X amount of questions. Uh, although you will not directly benefit from being in the study, the results may help future students at HSU or whatever, right? May help uh, future clients of blah, blah, blah agency. Um, don't put your name or any identifying information. We don't expect you to be injured. 
Um, you don't have to participate in the study and you can stop participation at any time without reprisal. Do, they, they typo this. You do not have to participate in this study and you stop participation at time without reprisal. So go ahead and write that, but write it correctly. That's wrong. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. If you think, feel free to contact you at blah, 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 or email blah, blah, blah. If you have questions concerning the rights of research subjects, you can identify, you can contact this person, the chair of the, and I'm gonna have to go and look at that person. I, I think that's Dr. Way right now, but I'm gonna have to go back and look. So for now, you know, I guess you have to leave that blank. Um, so again, you are voluntarily making this and you have the, the places for them to sign. Um, that's if you're doing like a paper and pen consent letter. If you're doing something that's fully online, you'll have to um, basically, like if you're doing, if you're doing an online survey, um, we'll probably just need to talk about that kind of one-on-one, -on -one. but really what you can do is use something like SurveyMonkey or um, maybe even Google Forms or something like that to create the survey. And then that survey will have an informed consent built in. And so it'll look a lot like that one I just showed you. It'll just be printed there and it'll have something like, you know, type your name at the bottom to indicate that you are giving consent to all the above or whatever. And so you would need to include that. All right, human subjects research training certificates. We'll talk about that in a second. You are gonna have to go through some sort of brief online training. Um, surveys, the copy of the survey itself or surveys, if you're having it. Vulnerable populations consideration form, as we said a second ago, if you're, if you are um, involving these vulnerable populations, let me pull it up again, see which ones they say here. Yeah, so we have children, pregnant women or fetuses, newborns, decisionally impaired. And so this typically refers to those who are, um, you know, have some kind of developmental delay, cognitive disability, something like that, uh, prisoner students. And then you're gonna have to go through and, and um, basically answer questions about what risks you're putting those folks in, depending on, on who you're, who you're, um, um, if our FERPA form, that's not going to be applicable for us. Um, other, any photo solicitation. So like any pictures or diagrams you need them to see any, like if solicitations, meaning like if you're advertising your survey at all, like you're putting a thing up on a, on a, whatever, like a cork board or something, a bulletin board saying, hey, please take my survey and call me in, or here's my QR code, whatever that is, right? You have something like that, then you're going to want to put that here as well. Um, all right, and this is the stuff for expedited and full. And this is about, it's all the same basically, except it's a different application, right? So you have your, what, what you hope you can get through the exempt research, um, but then the other ones are the expedited applications and then the full applications. All right, the review process, um, they're gonna submit to the other members within a week of the receipt. Investigators will receive confirmation that proposal was received. Reviews may take four to six weeks. Okay, delays are expected around holidays, breaks, or vacations. Please allow time to provide clarifications by the committee. Uh, proposals are determined. So they're going to respond by saying your proposal is either approved, approved with modifications, further information needed, or denied. Most of you on your first submission, most of you are going to end up with one of these two. Okay, it's pretty rare to get like a full approval after turning it in the first time. Usually what's going to happen is they're going to give you one of these two and they're going to say, please resubmit. Here's the changes we want you to make. Here are the things we want you to add and then resubmit. Um, now, the thing is, you've got to be real quick with your turnaround because as they said here, the review could take four to six weeks. And so if they took four weeks getting it back to you, you cannot take four weeks doing the revisions to get back to them. You got to take like two days to get that back to them. You got to move quick if you're gonna be able to, to get this done in time. Um, let's see. There, okay, then here's the training. You wanna complete the following free short courses. So here's, here, let me go through all this. HSU complies with the Department of Health and Human Services regarding regulation 45 CFR 46. Prior to the initiation of any study involving human subjects, investigators must have sufficient training to ensure the protection of human subjects. All HSU investigators must provide certification of a human subjects training course prior to submission of a request. Researchers may choose one of the following options, okay? This is the free option. So most of you are gonna probably wanna do that. You can see here, this protecting human research participants is a $40 course. 
this IRB basic human subjects research is $130. Those kinds of things can be required uh, if you're going through like a full review and the, um, the research you're doing has, the, has, has a pretty high potential to be risky for your subjects, then they might ask you to go through one of these. But that's not gonna be the case for most of you. Most of you, you can go through this introduction to clinical research or this one called the research question. You go to it, I'm just gonna click on that one. And you can see it'll have a thing where you have to log in, you have to give us some information. Um, and then it'll, uh, it'll give you like a little certificate when it's done. And then uh, and you need to save that certificate, okay? Because the certificate is the thing when you go turn this in, is it, is it here, submission instructions? Yeah. So the thing you're doing, the um, human subjects research training certificates, this is the thing you're turning in, right? That's a separate document. It'll probably come as like a PDF or something like that. So make sure when that, once you finish the training and that PDF shows up showing that you did it or you completed it or whatever, make sure you save that PDF to, you know, to something. Um, yeah, so you go through the training and then, yeah, that's really it. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's it. All right, so as I said before, make sure that you are going through this as quickly as possible, um, that you're having a quick, as quick turnaround as possible because as I said, that they may not, they're not, they may not be going fast. You know, I've seen this work um, as smoothly as um, someone submits an applica application. Two weeks later, they get a response saying, here, just make a couple changes. And then a week after that, they're approved. I've seen it go as smoothly as that. And I've also seen it go much more complicated. I've seen it go, they submit it. And then four weeks later, it comes back saying, make these changes. And then that person, and then they resubmit. And then three weeks later, it comes back saying, here's some more changes. And they resubmit. And then three weeks after that, it comes back saying, make, make some more changes. And that obviously presents some big problems for us as we're trying to think about the, you know, the schedule that we're on. So that's why it's so important to make sure that you, uh, getting it done as quickly as possible, answering all their questions, right? You don't want to just give a quick turnaround just to get it done. Because if the, if the resubmission doesn't actually address their concerns, then it's a waste of everybody's time, right? You gotta, you gotta do the things they've asked you to do, uh, but do them quickly, hopefully within a couple of days. So. All right, um, I'm gonna go and end this, end this video now. As always, if you have questions, then um, you know, shoot me an email or whatever. <laughs>